Hello everyone and thank you for joining me today. My name is Kinsey Matthews and I am a second year graduate student in the Fisheries and Conservation Biology Lab at Moss Landing Marine Labs. That's a photo of me on the left where I'm working as an intertidal ecologist for PISCO. But today I will be speaking with you about my lab at Moss Landing Marine Labs and how we are using a stereo video lander to survey the California coastline which is how to survey like a boss, the use of a stereo lander to survey rocky habitats along the California coastline. To start off, I'd like to quickly go through a little bit of background. U.S. West Coast ground fishes, such as rockfishes, are vulnerable to overfishing. This is because they are often long-lived, slow-growing, and late to mature. These life history traits make it hard for rockfish populations to recover from fishing pressure, Many rockfish species were declared overfished and have only recently been recovered after restrictions that were implemented in the early 2000s. One way to assess rockfish populations is through stock assessments. One of those stock assessments is, conduct is conducted by NIMS, the National Marine Fisheries Service. NIMS uses trawl surveys for their stock assessments and targets low relief habitats, consisting of sandy bottoms and cobbles. The untrawlable habitats that nymphs cannot access are often high-relief rocky habitats, where rockfishes are commonly found. As you might expect, there is a lack of data on ground fishes that live in high-relief habitats, and there is a need for a fisheries independent tool that can survey these areas. And that brings us to our goals. First, we want to improve data collection in areas that are inadequately sampled in the West Coast Groundfish Bottom Trawl Survey. Secondly, we want to develop a tool to rapidly survey coastwide areas of high relief rocky habitats for groundfish species. The first step in achieving these goals was to develop a video lander that could access these high relief habitats. The first prototype was built by Marine Applied Research and Exploration in 2011 to 2012. It was then used from 2012 to 2015. This lander has two cameras mounted in stereo configuration on a rotating base. This base rotated 360 degrees while the cameras were recording. On the bottom of this lander is a breakaway crab pot base that helps to prevent the loss of cameras in high relief rock. For analysis, the number of fish was counted over a 360 degree rotation. Whole fish that were captured in both cameras were measured along with the distance from the lander. However, there were several limitations to this design. The slow rotation of cameras sometimes resulted in the double counting of fish. The mechanical noise could also be a possible deterrent. And lastly, the bulky build led to slow vertical movements in the water column and made it difficult to place on rocks. To combat these limitations, the BOSS was designed. The BOSS, also known as the Benthic Observation Survey System, was funded by the Nature Conservancy and built by Mbari, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. The BOSS employs four stereo video camera pairs and one down camera. Each pair of cameras is on one side of the BOSS, which we label north, south, east, and west. For each pair of cameras, there is one up camera and one down camera. The up and down cameras are positioned so that there is a vertical overlap in their field of view. Between pairs of cameras, for example between the north cameras and the east cameras, there is a 30 degree separation between them so that one fish cannot be in two screens at the same time. This is essential as it greatly lowers our chances of double counting fish. There are four 160 watt lights at the top of the boss and one 160 watt light at the bottom of the boss. There are integrated sen sensors that give us information on our depth altitude, pitch and roll, temperature, and the position of the boss. There is also a fiber optic load-bearing umbilical that live streams to the ships and gives us real-time data. Lastly, the boss has a 400 meter depth rating, allowing us to survey some pretty deep habitats. For those of you that are unfamiliar with stereo cameras, here's a brief explanation and schematic. Two cameras are vertically positioned and towed in at 7.5 degrees each, so that their field of view overlaps with one another. While there are some areas that are not covered by both cameras, 
there is still a pretty large degree of overlap. This overlap allows us to accurately measure the length of fishes using the software CGIS. An important component of getting accurate length measurements for our fishes is to calibrate the boss before we deploy it out at sea. We calibrate each vertical stereo camera pair in the Ambari tank using a 3D cube with markers that are a known distance apart. The 3D cube is rotated through several different positions and different angles. We then go an event measure and use a line function to create lengths between the markers. This calibration file is then used post-cruise to calibrate our final recorded data. In the next few slides, I have some graphs that show our calibration error. Here I have graphed our calibration error with each pair of stereo cameras from a distance of around 2.5 meters between the boss and the cube. On the graph, we have the different cameras, east, north, south, and west on the x-axis and mean percent error on the y-axis. I've separated each camera into the different target sizes that we used for that calibration. Based on this graph, all cameras had a mean measurement error of less than 1%, with the smaller target size having a higher percent error than the larger target size. The graph from the previous slide showed the error associated from one distance from the boss. This graph is showing how mean percent error changes with increasing distance from the boss. The distance from the boss is on the x-axis, while mean percent error is on the y-axis. For this graph, there were three target sizes that were used to calibrate the boss, small, medium, and large. The same pattern is seen here as in that last graph, where the smaller target size seems to have more error associated with it. You can also see that mean percent error increases with further distance from the boss. However, our measurement error was less than 5% and generally less than 2%. When we compare the two graphs, we have two different stories. The previous graph shows the optimal error that we could ever get when the fish are only 2 meters away. This graph offers a more realistic view of the error we might expect to see when fish are rotating away from the cameras and are at increasing distances from the boss. And now I'm going to share with you a quick video of us deploying and then recovering the boss. As you can see, the boss is on deck and it's attached to that fiber optic load bearing umbilical. We then lower the boss into the water and we attach floats to the cable and this helps prevent the cable from falling down and obstructing our video. We then attach a Yale grip and 25 pound weights to it, and this creates a 30 meter watch circle so that when the boat drifts, we don't drag the boss off of the seafloor. We have two people who deploy the boss, one person who operates the winch and one person who operates the A-frame. We also like to have a fifth person who is our deck boss, who is in contact with the captain in the bow of the boat to just make sure everything is running smoothly and that we are communicating with our captain. As you saw in the video, the boss is deployed using a fiber optic cable. We have a GPS and GIS system that allows us to accurately place the boss around a feature. The boss underwent previous testing and we found that we can repeatedly drop the boss within five meters of our target location. Once it is a few meters off the bottom, we can use the down camera to try and find an optimal place to land the boss. For example, we try to avoid landing the boss on a pinnacle, as it might tip over, or in a hole, as it might get stuck. Once we land the boss in a suitable place, we let the sediment settle for one minute. Then we press record, turn on the lights, and record for three minutes. From there, we can pull up the boss about 30 meters from the ground and then hop the boss anywhere from 70 to 300 meters. We hop the boss in order to survey a particular feature based on our GIS maps that we have on the boat and can see in real time. Once we have finished surveying a feature, we can fully recover the boss on board before we steam to a new location. Back at the lab, we have to process and analyze all of our videos. We stitch the different camera views, north, east, south, and west, into one frame. That way we have one frame with all of the up camera views and one frame with all of the down camera views. This is shown on the figure on the right. Since we started recording right before the lights turned on, we can sync the cameras together based on when the lights turned on. We analyze three minutes of video and event measure. For each species, we determine max in and length. 
During that three minute video, we pick one frame with the greatest number of individuals from one species. That becomes our max in for that species. Max in is used as we don't have to worry about the double counting of fishes. Additionally, we can take length measurements of each species. To take a length measurement, the fish needs to be present in both the top cameras and the bottom cameras. We zoom in on a fish and draw a line from the tip of the snout to the caudal fin. That's also shown on the figure on that right from that red line. A length measurement and precision value is automatically generated. And these measurements allow us to get density and length frequencies for fishes. Now here is a video of what we might actually be seeing back at the lab. As you can see, there is oftentimes a lot going on with a variety of different species and a number of fishes. For many species, such as the ocean whitefish, their max in is usually close to the beginning of the video. With other species, such as the rosy rockfish, their max in might occur later, so it's important to watch for that entire three minutes. It's also important to look at both the down cameras and the up cameras. A fish in the up camera might not be present in the down camera, and vice versa. Remember, if a fish is not present in both cameras, we cannot take a length measurement. However, we can take a point count for our max in. So in this video, you can see a variety of species. You have ocean whitefish, rosy rockfish, chromis, olive rockfish, a bunch of different stuff going on. You can also see that there's a variety of different habitats. So in addition to maxin and length, we also take note of the substrate, relief, and the presence or absence of other species besides fishes. For example, is the substrate soft? Is it hard or a mix of both? Is the relief low, medium, or high? Are there gorgonians, corals, sea cucumbers, lobsters, or other life present in the video. Collecting that information gives us more data that can be used to help explain the patterns that we might be seeing. Since its creation, the boss has been taken all along the California coastline, from San Francisco down to the Channel Islands, including specific locations like Portuguese Ledge here in Monterey Bay, and San Clemente Island and Anacapa Island that are a part of the Channel Islands. To hear more about those specific research applications, I would implore you to check out some of the other talks from my colleagues who are involved with different BOSS projects, including Ryan Fields and Jackie Mohey, who are presenting in this session, and then Katie Sieri, who is presenting in the Marine Fish Ecology session. We are looking forward to continued collection of data on groundfish populations for stock assessments and for the monitoring of deep water MPAs. We also recently got funding from the Monterey Bay Sanctuary to evaluate corals. Overall, we are excited to see what new locations we can take the boss to and what information can be gleaned from this tool. And now on to acknowledgements. I'd like to thank the Nature Conservancy and Bari Moss Landing Marine Labs, the various research vessels we have worked with, and then all of the additional personnel who have helped work on this project. I'd also like to thank the Council on Ocean Affairs, Science, and Technology, also known as COAST, for funding my ability to attend this conference and to present to you all today. So thank you all so much for listening to my talk. Please contact me with any questions you might have, and I'd be happy to answer them. I hope you all have a wonderful time at the rest of your conference, and thanks again.